Okay, welcome to the show. My name is Paul Burgess, and I'm here today with Dr. Nick Engera. I'm hoping I've pronounced that right. Even he told me it was a difficult one. Um, who is um, the founder at Longevity Blog and advisor to a company called Do Not Age, which has a, a really cool um, longevity website. Um, done a lot of work in his life when it comes to biohacking and longevity. He was Master of Science from the University of Oklahoma. Um, and just does a whole heap of work in this longevity space. And the reason I wanted to get him on here today was because clearly at my age, um, longevity is a big, big focus for me and as it is for lots of people. So uh, Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to chat with you. I love talking with like-minded folks about longevity. It's a great topic and more and more people are piling on and it's a, it's a big trend that's just set to continue. It's exciting stuff. Well, the thing is, why would you not want to be interested in longevity? That's the thing. And, but for me, and I'm going to come to this question in a second for you, but as we get older, we kind of realize we're not going to live forever and there is going to be an end point. But for me, what happens is as I get older, I become more and more fascinated by just life and living an amazing life every day and being fulfilled and contributing and it's like actually life's fucking amazing so i don't really want it to end that quick so what can i do to to make it longer now if you'd have asked me that when i was 20 i'd have been like actually i'm not interested but now it becomes really prevalent so my first question for you because this is what kind of caught my eye with you in the initial initially was you got into this stuff really quite young, comparatively. So what, what made you do it at a young age? What is it that drew you to this thing? Because obviously starting younger is a, is a massive advantage, one would have thought. I love that, Paul. I love the, the way you're framing it in terms of your own personal journey and how as you've gotten older, it's become more of a focal point for yourself. But when it comes to longevity, there's, there's not a too young age to start. And that's one of the first things I'll say is, the way that I approach thinking about longevity is as a strategy, as a long-term thing that you're doing over the course of your life. It really becomes part of your own life philosophy. And I'm 35. I got really deep into the longevity movement and space at age 32. And there's a couple of factors that pulled that all together. But I would say one of the principal ones was that um, my wife actually got cancer at a very young age. Actually, it was diagnosed during the birth of my son, if you can imagine. This was oh, wow. a fairly traumatizing cesarean section. The appendix cancer uh, showed up, and it was you know 30 minutes between the most amazing moment in my life and the most terrifying one. Wow. And that really stuck with me, that experience of her going through the treatments. She had to have two different surgeries, chemotherapy twice, a few years apart. And she's now fine. She's in remission. It's a modern medicine miracle as far as I'm concerned. It's amazing what science can do these days. And that really stuck with me. It really stuck with me that not only could my wife get cancer in her late 20s, but two of my best friends the same year both got diagnosed with mm -hmm. cancer. One was an advanced colon cancer. The other was, other was testicular cancer that moved into his brain. Both of them had harrowing experiences, but also again, came out and are in remission today. But for something like that to happen in the late 20s, not just to one person in my life, but three very important people in my life, it really jumped out at me how quickly your mortality can strike you as a concept in your life. And it really got the gears going for me thinking about what can we do about this? We're here and we're now in 2021. Do we really need to keep living in a world where people get late stage cancer diagnoses? Well, I'll give you a bit of a prelude to some of the things that I'll say. The answer actually is becoming no, and that's really exciting stuff. And it's one of the messages that I wanna share with your audience, my audience, and, and more people. So they get it in their head that we can actually have a world where we are detecting disease at an early stage and treating it rather than these traumatic events where they, it shows up at a late, uh, late time. It's very, very interesting because, I mean, I've done a lot of work with cancer patients and we have seen it in them well before the doctors look at it. You know, if you know, know how to use a blood test, read a blood test properly and look at the, the markers that can potentially show that kind of thing going on, you can pick it up very early on. Uh, even when the doctors are saying, no, there's nothing wrong. And when they actually look at a, a deeper investigation, it, it, it shows up. And 
But what's interesting to me, and now I'm going to go right off topic, three people there in their late 20s, um, for me, I'd be really interested to know, one, were they all living in the same area? Two, has any anything been done to look at any toxicity or mould that they're holding, heavy metals, that kind of stuff? Because I see it a lot where people are holding a lot of mould, they're not aware of it, they get cancer, they get treated, they go into remission, and it comes back again some years later, because the thing that was driving it in the first place is still there, not been, not been addressed. So all that stuff is fascinating to me. I love that thing. But you're right, it brings that mortality in a lot earlier in the 20s than it does like me in my mid 50s, where we go, hmm, you know, there's, there's, some, <laughs> there's an end point here and I need to like push it away as far as possible. So if that's what it does, if it highlights that and gets people more aware that I need to start doing stuff now, I'm not just gonna wing it and get away with it, then it's, it's massively, massively useful to get that message out, right? You're absolutely right. And that's one of the things I've decided to dedicate a portion of my life to is getting that message out and helping people to think about the consequences of their mortality, but also the tools that are at their disposal for engaging with their health and thinking of it in a long term fashion. You know, I had a really fascinating experience when I went to the health nucleus in San Diego back in uh, when I was 32 years old in 2018. I went and visited because I was given a special discount for being a part of a program that was running with one of the founders, Peter Diamandis. And he has a quote that he likes to say often that I love to pair it on. And he's likely stolen it from somewhere else. And he says that, you know, the man with his health has a thousand wishes, but the man without it only has one. And that's the principle behind what I'm talking about here. And at the health nucleus, I actually saw what is possible for 21st century proactive healthcare, doing a full body MRI, full panel blood tests, coming out of that with a detailed picture of what was happening inside of my body and getting a clear bill of health. And I went actually back to the health nucleus again in 2019. I plan to go there and again in the future. But the interesting thing about this clinic is while they were the first really to the starting line, there are many other longevity clinics now showing up around the world as more people demand these types of services and vote with their dollar and say, yeah, you know, I think it's a good idea to have a full body health checkup. The, the, the technology is not perfect. We can have a misdiagnosis um, come out of an MRI scan, but we can approach that problem and solve it by using other modalities of sensing, like a CT scan, an X-ray, ultrasound, having more than one opinion come into it. We don't let the problems with it shut it down because really it is full of promise. And this is where the proactive health scene is moving, is taking advantage of technology, making it available to people who are willing to vote with their dollar and get that clear bill of health and keep checking in on themselves regularly. And that's becoming more and more widely available and it will continue to do so the more people who start thinking this way and think, you know what, I deserve that. So a couple of things. Um, if you look at the pinned tweet on my Twitter account, it is that saying, which is, anyway, you know, if you've got your health, you've got a thousand goals. If you don't have your health, you have one goal. And for me, that kind of represents how my, my practice works because what you're talking about is great. You know, let's have a look what's going on and then make sure we're either addressing any symptoms that are coming up or trying to manage things going forward. But before that, and this is where I think a lot of people miss the point, is prevention is better than cure. You know, there's no cure for Alzheimer's or dementia or potential certain cancers and stuff. If we prevent, we're, we're going to be in a much better position. And so looking at the prevention strategies... I think is paramount to people. And for me, one of the things you really need to address in that area are people's beliefs around their behaviors. Because if they believe it's okay to eat that ice cream on a regular basis, or it doesn't really matter about the blood glucose levels that I've got right now, I'm only in my twenties, I'll sort that out later on. Or they believe actually I want to game, I want to be gaming till 3 a.m. because that's what my friends do those beliefs will determine those behaviors and whilst those beliefs have been influenced by marketing and peer groups and advertising and social media and everything else 
they're not for the benefit of the patient, they're for the benefit of the gaming company or the ice cream manufacturer or whatever it is. So when we look at trying to prevent getting into those beliefs about things is really important. And it's kind of what you're doing is highlighting their current beliefs and then getting them to question them and say, look, there's this other stuff over here that you need to be looking at. And once we start looking at it from this point of view, we're going to get better results long term. Would you say that's kind of accurate? You're right. And what you're getting at here, Paul, is identifying our personal values and deciding how we will live or not live in accordance with those values. And when we're young and we're not thinking about those, we need events in our life that teach us about those values. And you know, my own experience with my friends and my wife that I alluded to earlier and other ones in my own personal life have taught me how important it is to value my well-being. And that says more than just my bodily well-being. It means my mental well-being, my sense of purpose. It brings together a lot of concepts. And being clear on that and knowing that that is the thing I want to chase with my time and energy. And not only do I care about it so much for myself, I want others to see that as well. And a big part of even wanting to take care of your well-being is having the right mindset. And mindset is powerfully important. I think one of the things that has helped me get clear in my values and also have a positive mindset about my health has been meditation, mindfulness, and taking the time to reflect and think about what do I want out of my life and what have I learned from the experiences in my life about my health and well being. And again, when you don't have your wealth, or excuse me, when you don't have your health, you are left with only wanting it back. And you can see that every time you're sick, you know, I'm, a, I'm actually a triathlete and I've been doing a lot of training. And every time I end up with a, you know, a niggle in my toe or, you know, pulled hamstring and I got to take a week off, all I want to do is get better. All I want to do is get back after working hard and chasing my goals. And so being able to think ahead and think to yourself, how can I stay well? Because I value that. It is something that is the real foundation for getting rid of the bad habits that you were just describing and finding the joy and pleasure in making your health a hobby and having a fun time with, you know, seeing what you can do with this thing, this body, this thing, what can I do with this and explore that and see what it can provide you with. Cause it, it's amazing what our biology is capable of. And it's a fun thing to explore. Yeah, and it's so adaptive, you know, it will, it will adapt to your, your new behavior, whether that's good or bad. And it will, be influenced by it but what you said something there was really interesting is that you know have fun with this thing i think a lot of people especially the younger generations now who have who have grown up in an environment that promotes performance in a in, in a fitness field so you'll see a lot of people you know a lot of social media instagram twitter whatever it is saying you know like you let's run a marathon or a, a triathlon or you know, this is the before and after picture or, you know, people need to look like this and they need to have a six pack and need to be shredded and all this kind of stuff. And you've got to get in the gym and do this six days a week and eat this food and you should measure your way your calories out and your macros and, and, and it gets very, very detailed. And there's no fun in that. No. There's no fun in the process and there's no fun in the end result because it doesn't make you happy. All it does is waste months or years of your life chasing something that is never really going to bring you any fulfillment and so and I get what you're saying is like you know when you do your triathlete stuff it's what gives you that energy and that excitement and that passion and you love doing it and that's exactly what someone should be doing not I need to go to the gym because that's what it says on my program um, because if I don't then I'll eat that extra apple and I've got to do two hours on, on a treadmill it's like it's, it's, it completely skewed the perspective of it is completely skewed and so for me i'll tell you what i've found recently really useful is what is the minimum effective dose of what i need to do to allow me to have the capacity to enjoy life as much as possible so if it's training for example minimum effective dose in the gym i can do 25 minutes of some resistance work using triple drop sets, very few of them in, out, done. If I'm doing cardio, recently I've started just throwing basketball at hoops recently because it just gets me up and down. It's something I enjoy doing. So I can do half an hour of that, get a real sweat on, enjoy it. If the alternative is going to run on a treadmill for 
30 minutes, never gonna happen. I'm, I'll find every excuse not to do it. And so getting that minimum effective dose, doing something you love and enjoy, the bottom line is how much does that then improve your quality of life? Because that's what we're after, right? Better quality of life, feeling healthier, being more passionate, being more fulfilled, the rest of it will take care of itself. So what you're saying, I'm 1 million percent down with, I think it's a, it's a fantastic approach. And to see it in someone as young, and I know you don't think you are maybe young at 35, but to see it- Oh, I think I'm young. That's part young, of that mindset, yes. It's, it's fantastic to see, because that's the new generation that's gonna come up with that new message. Trouble is we need to get it out as much as possible. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And one of the things that you're digging into there that is a hard lesson for even some of my age, and I think younger generations to learn in the social media world of normalcy is that trying to put on anything for another person or trying to get approval from another group of peers or a group of uh, people whom you think you look up to like teachers or supervisors, Really, at the end of the day, you need to chase what gives you satisfaction, what makes you feel fulfilled, what you love to do. And I love the illustration you were pulling together with shooting some basketball and finding something you love to do. Because when it comes to fitness, one of the things that people get stuck on is they have an idea of what it means to be fit and what exercise is. And unless you can find what you love to do that gives you exercise, it's always going to be a slog. It's going to be a suffering thing that you have to do. And just because I fell in love with triathlon, and I'm kind of a crazy person in that way, and I've got my triathlon club buddies who are also my fellow crazies, it doesn't mean that's what you need to do for someone like yourself to be healthy or anybody who's listening to this. They just need to get out there and do what makes them happy. It might be walking. It might be hiking. It might be surfing. That is where you start. And you can build on the vulnerabilities and weaknesses you have in your fitness from there, but finding that thing that you love to do, that you that aligns with your values and you have fun with, that's the place to start. And that's often one of the best things you can start doing for your health. I think where it falls down is that people are, before they even get into that stage of, I just need to move and be active and just be functional, they're, they're immediately into, this is what I need to do for performance. And they're not performing, they're not gonna compete. They're certainly not gonna be at some kind of Olympic or you know, CrossFit Games level or anything like that, all they're doing is following what other people have done, or oh, that must be the way to go. If, if Matt Fraser, fittest man in the world, five times on the trot and everything else, trains this way, then that's what I should be doing. No, it's, going to, it's the last thing you should be doing because you're never going to be, why are you trying to emulate something that you're never going to be competitive at? And if you are competitive at that kind of sport, there's no health benefit to it. Right? There's, a, there's a performance benefit for sure, and it might make you feel better about yourself. But when people really push themselves to the degree in which they need you know, copious amounts of recovery and support in their rehabilitation and everything else, that's not healthy. That's just trying to push yourself further than you've ever gone before. And, they, and everyone gets kind of sucked into that channel before they even look at, well, what's the things I enjoy doing? And let me go and do some stuff just to just so I can get this stuff done and enjoy it so I can get on with the rest of my life and be happy and pro productive and everything else. And I think we're going to see a, a, a U-turn in things over the next few years, I think, because people are going to realise that, you know, killing yourself in the gym six days a week ain't productive. And, and it ends up with problems later on. But anyway, talking of being, uh, talking of later on, because we want to talk about longevity, from your perspective, obviously it's a lifestyle, right? It's not something that you just go, okay, I'm gonna take a few of these things and then everything else will take care of itself. And I find that a lot of people look for that. Like they look for, okay, what can I take that allows me to continue the bad behaviors that I'm doing to offset it? And sadly, obviously that doesn't work because it's the behaviors that are your biggest problem. The other things are kind of just icing on the cake. So when you started in this, where did you find the biggest wins when it comes to longevity? Yeah, I love this question because it comes back to the way I've started to direct my thinking and the types of resources I'm trying to put up on longevity blog is that really what we need to have is we need to have a strategy and we need to think about maximizing our health span and our lifespan through the lens of that strategy. And it's not something that you can pick up 
and just implement in your life based on what somebody else is doing or what your favorite biohacker is doing. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of messaging out there that really is just marketing and people trying to keep you entertained and coming back to their social media feed. And that stuff can be quite distracting. Really what you need to figure out when it comes to thinking about longevity is what are your risks? What can you know about your risks? And there's some really practical tools for doing this. The first of which is just a family and medical questionnaire and just pulling together some information. You know, what were the diseases that your grandparents on both sides got? What about your parents, aunts and uncles? This starts to formulate a picture of what you might be at risk for that you can then take to your doctor and have a good chat with them about. And in fact, most doctors would have you do a health questionnaire in family history if you wanted to have a discussion with them about your future disease risk. But there's also some really cool technologies that are maturing. And you, in fact, just had my friend Joe Cohen on your show just a few episodes ago from Self to Code. If folks are watching this, they should go give that a listen. I just interviewed him on Longevity Blog. And one of the things that has really, really come about with his team in, in the 85 odd folks in that team and the 60 plus data scientists and geneticists that they've built up is this impressive leap forward. You know, every once in a while you see a company nail it. That is what South Dakota is doing. And it's really impressive. You know, I'm, I'm a CTO at a tech company myself, and I know what it looks like when somebody leaps ahead of the pack. And this is precisely what they've done. And through artificial intelligence and data science, they're starting to pull together this, this single nucleotide polymorphism mutations and genes that we used to get genetic reports from that were based on one or two of those. They're pulling together millions of them. And they're doing it in a way where they can give you personalized advice on what your risk profile is and also some things you might do about that risk profile. So when we think about a longevity strategy and we think about looking forward at what our personal journey into our later years looks like, we have to know what things to take on in our strategy, what things am I at risk for. Brief illustration. Let's say you find out you, just, you did a little family history questionnaire and you get to thinking about that uncle of yours who died in his 50s from a heart attack. And you say, look, you know, maybe that's something I should go get checked out. You go work with your doctor, you get a blood test, you get a your cholesterol panel comes back. Turns out you've got um, a LP little a lipoprotein gene in your family. And people who have this often die at very young from heart attacks. And you found that out when you were 25. Good on you. Now what you can do is be on the right medications to stay ahead of that risk. So that's just one illustration of many. Everybody's story is going to be different, but this is the type of thing that I encourage people to think about is can you assess what your risks are and try to get ahead of those? Because there's simply too many wellness optimization things out there that may give you a little bit of a tweak here or there, but if you're not taking on the big stuff and you're not thinking about what's really going to probably get you in the end, okay. you're not really thinking about longevity. 100%. My, my um, uh, let me get it right. My father, his mother, both died of cancer. My mother's mother died of cancer. My mother's father had a stroke. No heart disease particularly but um, plenty of cancer around. And um, that, when I look at the, my genes, I'm an APOE4, which means Alzheimer's potential um, dementia kind of thing, but inflammation is, is an issue, mm -hmm. as well as cholesterol is an issue, um, which are all cardiovascular um, issues. Plus I have a gene for um, more likely diabetes. So uh, blood glucose management issue. So all of that together, just that in and of itself, is at the great look. When you when you when you get out the uh, when you get out of the books and start thinking about, oh, okay, how am I going to get around these things? But being aware of it is the biggest biggest advantage you can have because you go, okay, I shouldn't do a ketogenic diet with high saturated fat because that's going to kill me. <laughs> it's going to be pretty bad. So let me not do that. But I can use low carbohydrate or Mediterranean, or lots of fiber, and all those sort of things, which do react well to those sort of areas. So like you say, knowing that to start with puts you ahead of the game when you're when you're trying to make the, the good lifestyle choices and sleep and manage your stress and all that kind of jazz, which works for most people.
Of course, you know the basics. We know the basics. They're the same right. four things they always are. Yeah. <laughs> Sleep, but, diet, exercise, and stress. Yep. The, but the thing is, most people know that, right? And, but it needs something to almost tip them over the edge to take action on those things. Because it's, and, and I'll keep coming back to the, the younger generation thinking this way now. Because when they're younger, they're generally it's like, yeah, sleep, I'll do that when I'm dead, right? Or stress, no, nah, the stress is fine. You know, we have to right, we get so much promotion on Instagram or social media where you've got to, you know, grind until you make it successful. Ain't no one grinding and making it successful. They're all making themselves sick and empty and unfulfilled because they're so broken. And so, but that, that's where people are coming from. That's how they measure their success. So they need something to get people's perspective to change from this does need to be looked at and I do need to make those changes. And like you say, getting a, a DNA test that shows this is what's coming if you're not careful, right? This is in, definitely in the post. Then um, that's hopefully a good tool to make people to start to think, okay, let's look at this differently. I'm convinced that it is if you go to the right source. And that's why I, I point to our friend yeah. Joe and, and self decode because they're doing it right. I also got a really great genetic analysis from the health nucleus, but that's pricey. What, what Joe's team is doing is a hundred bucks. It's amazing yeah. what they've been able to accomplish. So this is just one example of the type of future that we're going to be able to pull from to shape our thinking about our longevity and, and think, look decades ahead. And that can be the real game changer when it comes to thinking about what diseases am I at risk for? Can I offset that risk through certain actions? And that really can move the needle on health span uh, for an entire population. If we, if the, in mass, we start taking advantage of that information and acting on it. So it's pretty exciting to be alive in this day and age with respect to that technology. Of course, there's many other things that are coming down the pipeline, which are arguably equally exciting as equally as exciting. Hmm. So, so someone has made the decision, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to take these steps in my lifestyle. I'm going to make these positive changes. I'm going to start being happier because I feel now I'm doing the right things for myself. I think that causes a lot of people anxiety in that they don't know, is this the right diet for me? Am I doing the right thing about that? Is this the right exercise? And, and kind of, it's all about the stress around, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Everything is, you know, this person says I should be carnivore. This one says I should be vegan. This one says I should only drink water on a Tuesday. <laughs> it's like, you know, the whole thing is so confusing. People don't know what to believe anymore. And so I think getting some clarity over that takes a huge weight off people's shoulders. And I tend to find that the patients I work with, because because we do that kind of stuff with them, in a very short period of time, they, they just feel a lot better because they just feel as like, no, I'm on the right track now. I'm, I'm not confused anymore. I know what I'm doing. I'm happy with it. And I can do it. That's the other thing the anxiety people have is, well, that's all very good, Nick. You know, you can tell me this, that, and the other, but am I going to be able to do that? You know, what's mm. it going to be that, you, maybe you're going to ask me something that's so important for me to do, but I just can't stop drinking alcohol on the weekend or whatever it is. I don't think you need to, by the way, but um, that's one of the things people get concerned about. Or they say, oh, what am I going to have to eat? Because their perception of food, in inverted commas, isn't actually food. It's some other pseudo created process thing that, but they've lived on it all their life and they think, well, that's what I eat. And I don't really like vegetables and I haven't eaten those for years. And I was always like that. As a kid, it made me throw up. I hear that a bit. Really? Okay. Or was that you just trying to not eat them, trying to get out of it? And really, you've just not gone back to them as yet. So there's all this kind of anxiety around things like, can I do it? And all the rest of it. I think it takes a little while for people to really get the perspective of, look, all I'm going to do is the things I can do. And the things I can do, so long as they're in the right direction, are going to be massively beneficial. So, Well, this, it's an overwhelming space. There's so much information yeah. coming from all directions. It's conflicting, as you've pointed out. And you can feel like there's one too many things to do, which is why we need to organize yeah. the a framework for approaching all this information, which comes back to having a strategy, comes back to knowing what's the most important thing to do. You mentioned the minimum effective dose. 
if you understand your risk profile moving forward, you know what things you need to pay attention to. And the other stuff is just bonus. So some folks have a great genetic structure for not gaining weight. Other people were dealt a completely different set of cards. And being able to understand that will change we know which place you're coming from in terms of genetic makeup will change which diet will work for you. It's that way across everything. And it's really a personalized journey that you have to take ownership with. It does feel a bit overwhelming to do that. But if, if you can make it an evidence-based thing where you add one or two things at a time so that you know what's working, self-experimenting is a big thing in my book. Being able to know something's working for you by only turning one or two knobs at a time and saying, you know what, that was a good decision. I'm going to keep doing that. Allows you to build out an evidence-based stack of things, whether that's strategy, whether that's supplements, whether that's exercise, diet changes, that works for you. And it becomes a little bit of a fun thing to figure out because you're always trying to figure out what's the next thing I'm going to tweak what am I going to add to what I'm doing? And it's always this turning of the optimization knob in a new direction. And that can be quite fun. You could turn that overwhelm into, okay, I'm going to do the most important things first. I'm only going to add a few things at a time and I'm going to have fun as I figure out what works for me. And that is the way to turn that overwhelm on its head and, and do something that is immediately accessible and doesn't bring on that anxiety. And, and 100% agree because most people, go to the end of that first. In other words, they go, okay, these are all the supplements that are said to give me longevity. Let me go and just take them all now. And they haven't done the first bit. And actually doing the first basic stuff, sleep, eating, training, stress, they kind of give you the biggest wins anyway. And so you may find that actually anything else is, in, is just surplus to needs at the moment. You may just think, okay, you know, as long as I do that, I'm good. I think there's a big element of you know environmental toxicity and things like that that we're having to battle against nowadays and a lot of biohacking is is almost the balance of what we're having to put up with in the modern world but i think getting the basics right is kind of the biggest win people can get now here's a here's a question for you i get a lot of patients that come to me with i mean a, a list of supplementation they're taking when even i'm like how do you have time to take that much in a day? No, I'm not even kidding. Right? <laughs> and then, so they go, here's a list of things I'm taking. And, but I'm still getting all these bad symptoms. I'm like, okay, we know these aren't working, right? And also I've got all these in my cupboard. I'm just wondering which one of those I should take as well. Mm. How, one, do we get them to go, supplementation is not the, the first step, which is kind of your testing, like you're saying, and get that strategy together properly. And then once they get to that point of going, okay, what are we going to add in? Where do you think you start with that whole maze of information? Because there are so many things out there that are promising you, you know, longer life and all the rest of it. But some of them aren't going to work that well and others are going to be actually quite beneficial. But where would you even start there? How would you know where to, what to pick first? Well, what we would pick first, I would suggest, is based on our strategy and knowing what our risks are. But we also need to determine the efficacy of something that we're taking. Now, there's a lot of different ways to think about this. And the traditional scientific view tends to be, we're going to run this supplement or this pharmaceutical through a clinical trial with a significant number of humans that are randomized, controlled, double-blind, placebo-tested, and controlled type studies to give us the answer. And that does help with many, many things. However, I don't know that it's the best way to approach your personal stack building because what we're learning about biology and genetics continually is just a vast complicated nature of it. It's just insane. You know, my, my training, my background vocational training is in atmospheric science and meteorology. And one of the guys who founded the modern concept of chaos theory was actually an atmospheric scientist that came up with some of his ideas as he was trying to model the atmosphere. The biology that's happening inside of your body is orders of magnitude more complicated than the weather. And you know how well we do the weather forecast these days, right? It's so it's, it's a very complicated thing that you're dealing with. And so you have to respect that. 
And, and you have sorry, to think about I'm, what you want to try to go for and do it in a controlled way. Yeah, sorry, just to put up a point on that, you know, it, it, it's difficult to predict the weather nowadays. Look how much we've screwed it up. You know, and we've managed to completely ruin the planet and the way it's reacting to everything that's going on. And we're seeing that in its flooding and uh, hot spots and all the rest of it, the fires and what's going on. We're doing that in orders of magnitude more to our own bodies with our lifestyles and the foods and our stress and the internet and social media and everything else. So, you know, again, coming back to your first point, get your strategy, have one at least, because that's going to be the biggest, biggest um, step in the right direction for you. And it takes you away from all of the, the rest of the confusion that's going on. So you're absolutely right. You know, what's going on inside us is it's crazy complicated. It is. But what's interesting is that what that medical science has shown us is that there are a good representation of biomarkers, you know, blood-borne biomarkers that we can test that can tell us something. And what's really interesting about what's happening with at-home testing and consumer access to blood testing, genetic testing, biological age testing, NAD testing, is that it's expanding and proliferating and becoming more widely available. So most folks would be surprised to learn that there are a number of businesses that will allow you to purchase your own blood test. You can go into the lab, get it drawn, specifically request what you want, pay 50 to 200 bucks, depending on what you're wanting to test and how expansive that is and get your own results back. And now you should really interpret this information with the doctor, but we can set that part of this discussion aside for a second. And remember that that's in scope here, but you can do a lot with this and on some really fundamental metrics. So for example, if you were to choose your LDL, HDLC and LDLC cholesterol levels and your triglycerides. And you said, you know, my doc's been telling me my LDL cholesterol is a bit high. I know I'm not eating that well. I've got some numbers here. I'm going to try a different diet. I'm going to go low carb Mediterranean diet for six to 12 weeks. And I'm going to order my own blood test and I'm going to see what happened to my cholesterol levels. And during that time, I'm not going to try to do too many other things. It's already hard enough to change my diet. And I'm going to see, is there a difference? And if you run a well-controlled experiment over a short period of time where you're only changing one or two things and you know what you want to measure, you can do this yourself and you can figure out and see, you know what, I changed my diet and my cholesterol numbers are great. And all of a sudden I feel great about that. And I have the personal evidence I need to know that this diet is producing a measurable benefit in me. And now I can turn and try my next experiment to further optimize my health. This is the way I want people to start thinking about this because it's very, very powerful to turn this process of, you know, trying one or two things at a time, measuring before and after, running your own self-experiment, trying to control it as best you can. It puts so much power back in your hands uh, to be able to do this stuff. And, you know, I've run a few self-experiments on Longevity blog, one with nicotinamide mononucleotide, another one with trying to improve glycan age through diet. Uh, I'm about to post one up about diet and cholesterol using lab test analyzer from self to code. I'm trying to show some examples for folks to see how you can do this, because I think in this age of being able to order your own tests and try this stuff out in a controlled way can start to inform this audience and other audiences around the world, what works for them. And they can figure it out themselves with a little help from their doctor. Yeah, absolutely. Do you, have you ever used nucleotides and tried anything with those to see how that benefit would work? No, I've not. Um, that'd be an interesting one. I mean, we, we've done a lot of work with nucleotides in, an, in, a, in their pure form and how they help with cell replication and repair and things like that, and also immune and uh, stress response and, and that kind of stuff. And it really... Are you referring to peptides or nucleotides? Uh, nucleotides. Peptides? Nucleotides. Nucleotides. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. And... Um, um, it's, it's it's really it's really quite bizarre. I um I came in contact with a, a Swiss company that make them about eight or ten years ago, and they were telling me about them. And I'm like, okay, well, this just sounds one of those things that's too good to be true. And if it was that good, everyone would know about it. And actually, it isn't too good to be true. It, it does what it says on the tin, 
and people still don't know that and and it's a really unusual thing because it gives you all of the building blocks you need for cellular replication which is kind of the most important thing for most people they need to keep making new cells otherwise that's game over and um it's not expensive it's highly effective it's got lots of human studies not just rats or mouse or whatever it is and yet the 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 whole um the whole area of nucleotide supplementation is mainly in animal husbandry because it gets them bigger lower body fat bigger protein so bigger muscle mass so that when they go to slaughter they're a much more valuable animal and and keeps them healthy and, and whatnot and um, and it's crazy how it hasn't moved on to onto the uh, the human side so much but um yeah i use it in a lot of patients and i use it I, I, i've done lots of work with it and i'd be really interested to see if um, instead of it just being anecdotal from my perspective, whether or not you constructed something a bit more scientific and worked out if we use this, are we going to get better results? Because I think uh, they, they, they work really well. But, but things, um, things like you said, um, MND and um, resveratrol and that kind of pathway, there's a lot of talk about how that can be very useful. You know, David Sinclair is very outspoken about it, obviously. Um, and there's lots of other things that people swear by is is, is a, a great products from your perspective would you say there's a category or or a mechanism that's better to focus on when we're looking at longevity so would it be like an antioxidant or would it be a cell replication or would it be some other sort of category that you think is a is a good starting point well, it's, it's a difficult question to answer. And unfortunately, I can't give you a simple one because again, we're dealing with a very complex issue. Yeah. And in the aging space, we turn to this breakdown of the things that are behind aging, which are the nine hallmarks of aging. And these are areas that no matter what we do in our body with our health and our fitness and our supplement stack with that's all available to us today will inevitably be happening to us until we find radically new ways to address those underlying issues in the biology itself. So we have some promising early stage evidence that, for example, one of those hallmarks of, of aging, which is cell senescence, which is when a cell effectively should die, but doesn't and secretes inflammatory signals into its environment and starts a feedback cycle of inflammation and more cell death. These senescent cells, it's is a, a target for pharmaceuticals that are being developed, even some early stage uh, supplements that we have available to us, like physetin is one, for example, or quercetin another. Th there are ways that we are discovering how to remove those senescent cells from the body. So as we under mature our understanding of all these different areas of the nine hallmarks of aging, we'll develop interventions that allow us to address those challenges. And really there will need to be some holistic picture of how to systemically apply each of these strategies mm -hmm. if we're seriously going to be extending human lifespan, which I think we will. I think that's inevitable. Technology is an inevitable march forward and it will enable some amazing things, but we're not there yet. So how do we answer your question now? And again, to answer the question now, we really need to think about what is our biology at risk for, in my view, because there's just simply too many things to add to the stack. And if we can focus in on what we know is likely to get us in a few decades or be the first problem we encounter, we can do some homework, we can go look at the supplements in that space and we can start taking them. I know that I have an elevated risk of developing prostate cancer, as many men do later in their life, but at a younger age, because both my grandfather and my father went through elevated PSA levels in their you know, late 40s, early 50s. And so I take lycopene every day, 10 milligrams. It's a supplement I stick in my stack. And I take it without question. I'll just take it every day because it's a well-known antioxidant that works well in managing prostate health. So there's a fundamental, very basic example of how I can choose what things I would like to take. And really the only lens I can give to simplify this for you, in my view, is again, that longevity strategy. Yeah, and again, you know, what's great about that answer is you need to just do the basic stuff, right? Get your strategy, understand your risks, 
and just work with them. Don't worry. Which the reason I asked the question was these people that come with these massive lists of things that they're taking are clearly doing it based on the fact they heard it on a podcast or they read it on an Instagram post or whatever. It's just, oh, well, that must be all right, then I'll take that. And that's why they get into this confusion of huge amounts of supplementation at a very high cost, I've no doubt, but not really knowing what's going on. And then say, look, I've got all these ones as well that I bought based on what I've heard, but should I take them or not? I said, well, go back to that beginning. And that's what is so great about your strategy is know your risk and just work with those first. Um, one of the big things that a lot of, uh, certainly in the last four or five years, a lot of people have been talking about is fasting, intermittent fasting, reduction of calorie intake, that kind of thing to uh, prolong either cell life or get autophagy to clear out things and detoxify and that kind of thing. From your perspective, and I think I know what you're going to say, but I want to ask anyway, because I want other people to hear it from someone else rather than me. Is that a useful tool? Yes. Fasting is an absolute valuable tool in the toolbox. How you use it and who should use it, again, that's the complicated answer. Yeah. But of course, when we talk about fasting, it's not as simple as just saying you should fast or that fasting is good or bad. It, there's a couple of different categories in there. There's res time restricted eating, where we only eat during a certain time of the day. There's dietary restriction, where we remove a certain component of the diet to help with the amount of calories we're eating. An extreme example is a ketogenic diet, which I've tried, of course. And then there's the actual true fasting, which is going for long periods of time without taking in any significant calories, just some water, some electrolytes. And that's a true calorie restriction that's happening in that sense. And so I've experimented with all of these. And in a way, it's a unanswered question around how many health benefits do we derive from fasting, specifically with something like autophagy. So we hear a lot about autophagy and fasting. My problem with it is we can't measure it. There is some early stage research around uh, an enzyme, I think called Becklin C1A. It's something along those lines. Don't quote me on that. But there is some early research that's, that's beginning to point toward markers of autophagy that we might be able to in the future use to see whether or not we are triggering that cell death and cleansing process and recycling of proteins and amino acids that we think we are when we're fasting, but we simply just can't measure and prove that yet on an individual basis. So I have a bit of an issue with going for the autophagy benefits and saying there's a lot of hype and overuse of that term. However, it is absolutely legitimate that there is some level of that going on in animal models and that there are benefits to humans far and wide from fasting. Mm -hmm. And humans have been doing it for a very long time and it's incredibly safe and it's a great tool. And if particularly if you're someone who needs to lose a significant amount of weight, to, you, know, you look into long-term fasting. There are people who will take a multivitamin water and do that for three months and lose all that weight. It's, it's an amazing tool. There's other folks who will focus on just what works for them. Maybe I don't eat breakfast and maybe I wait till the mid-afternoon to start eating and they lose a lot of weight that way. And this is one of the biggest things people are trying to figure out is how do I improve my weight and lose some weight? And what's really going on behind that is your metabolic function. And one of the things we do know about fasting that's really encouraging is that it, it, because it restricts calories, it starts to reintroduce the better uh, amounts of insulin sensitivity in the body, meaning that your insulin, when it's secreted, it's doing its function of removing glucose from the blood and putting it into cells. And we're getting rid of those risks that we have around prediabetes and diabetes, which are quite terrible and bring on all sorts of other diseases. So the way that it improves glucose levels and the metabolic function with your body is another real winner for fasting across the board in my view. So it's a great tool. It's certainly something we can use. Does it do all the great things that Jason Fung tells us and the other fasting gurus tell us? We really can't say that yet in humans, yeah. but I think the day is coming soon when we will be able to do that and measure it ourselves, which yeah. of course you'll know I'll be covering. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I agree as well, by, by the way. I think you know, it's hyped to be this amazing thing, as is everything that people are trying to sell. Um, but there's a value to it and there's a benefit and there's a, for the right people, it's great. 
some people just do really well eating three meals a day but reducing the calories to a sensible amount other people aren't able to do that because they have these like you say these blood glucose spikes and drop drops and it causes lots of hunger and they can't really manage to eat small amounts so they'd rather eat just two big meals and all that again it's all pre personal preference to people but here's another thing um and i know we're, we're pushing on on time so i won't take too much longer but um I saw a post the other day and it's such a common thing. You know, I was 400 pounds and I'm 180 pounds and I used intermittent fasting and a ketogenic diet and look how amazing I look. And I feel, I feel better than I've ever felt. But you feel better than you can remember because going up to 400, you had to go to 200 and 250 and 300 and da-da-da, right? So it didn't happen overnight. But I kind of made a comment on it, which maybe I was in a bad mood, maybe, I don't know. But basically I said- <laughs> Oh, it's dangerous. <laughs> yeah. I said, it's impressive and that's great. You know, and it's fantastic you took back control of your health. What I'm interested in is how do we stop getting people to 450 pounds in the first place? Because that's where the real gold is. You know, don't get sick and then go, look, I use this amazing strategy to get myself back to being healthy again. Just just not get sick in the first place. And your strategy process find out the things you need to address you know know those risks and then not kind of focus your attention on those that in and of itself will always prevent the weight gain or the unhealthy living because you're specifically looking at things that you're trying to address and there's nowhere that that's going to say eat as much pizza as you like you're never going to have a problem with it but it's going to be a sensible approach. And therefore, if younger and younger people are having that perspective, oh, let me just see what my genes are saying. Hmm, it says I shouldn't be doing that. Okay, let me just dial that back a bit. And if they can manage to do it in their peer group and all the social media influence and marketing and everything else, if they can manage to stick to that, that will prevent huge amounts of people having to go on diets ever. So no one's going to, no one's going to love you for that because I've never said a book. But prevention is better than cure, right? You wouldn't sell anything. Yeah, that's that's right. Exactly. That's one of the challenges with with selling prevention. And you know, you mentioned the strategy. It's it's the strategy and it's the mindset. Those are the two things that go together here. And what we often lack is really understanding what our values are, what we're here for, and what gives us satisfaction. And being able to understand some of those things and do that internal work will address some of the issues that folks with exceptional weight gain are experiencing because many times we're we're using that to numb another pain that we have or um, to cope with something that's not going well in our life and uh, being able to identify and just have that th thought process crack open what's important to me often doesn't get triggered until there's a health scare mm -hmm. and so sometimes you see people do those big health journeys because their doctor says to them look you're not going to make it another year and they look and they turn and they look at their kids and like, I got to be here for them. It's, it's, it's different for everyone, but it is about that trigger for that mindset shift that happens to, to bring those success stories. And that brings us right the way back to the beginning of this conversation, which was beliefs about your behaviors, what the consequences are, change those beliefs, your behaviors will change and therefore your outcome will change. So, um, you know, there's so much to it and yet it almost breaks down to be some quite simple things. Get a, get a good strategy, know what you've got to focus on, know what your risk is, and then kind of everything else will take care of itself. Don't make it overly complex. Yeah, run some self-experiments and, yeah. and try some things out. You know, one thing I'm actually playing around with right now is NAD testing, yeah. where you can measure your intracellular NAD levels. And I haven't proven anything with it yet. I'm still running another experiment at the moment um, involving another supplement. But I, I actually have the privilege of working with some technologies and trying some supplements at a very early stage because of the work I do with Do Not Age, um, which is, you know, people think of them as a supplement company, but really they're a research organization. Mm -hmm. And we're talking to the scientists who are coming up with this, the latest stuff, and we're bringing it online and making it available to people. And I love being a part of this because it allows folks to get access to clean, safe supplements at a good price so they can figure out what works for their health journey. And everybody's gonna have a little bit of a different thing that works out for them. Um, but it's it's really fun to get to be a part of seeing a new idea from a scientist come through to how we're going to make this be a, a supplement and put it on shelves and ship it around the world. And then what's going to happen when people take it? Because the things you hear back from folks 
when they try out uh, a new supplement. Like some folks, when they use NMN, the, the NAD booster, have phenomenal things that happen to their bodies. And other folks will say, hey, it didn't, didn't work for me. Mm. I love that nuance. It's so fascinating to me. And I've tried um, NMN before, liposomal versions and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Um, NAD on a kind of liposomal version as well. And I kind of don't really respond much to that, that I notice. But, you know, who knows whether or not it's working anyway, if it's causing me better cellular function and bone function or whatever else, or maybe I'll just run at a level that I'm quite happy with and things are okay, who knows. But definitely trying it out on its own. Does it do you any good? Yes, no, don't know. Okay, what's next? They're, they're, they're great fun. I mean, you never get bored of that, right? You're always going to... No, you can make it a stuff. hobby. Yeah. yeah. You're always as long as you don't do too much at once, don't buy all the supplements at one time. Just buy yeah. one or two. Yeah. Keep a journal, measure before and after whatever you can and have a real hard chat with yourself and don't let your brain trick you because that placebo will get you. Yeah, yeah. There's a big statistic somewhere. Placebos are more effective than the than the actual uh, the, the, the medication or whatever it is. So here's a, here's a placebo pill. It's more effective than anything. Have you ever tried me through <laughs> I've not. I see folks all over Instagram with their blue tongues. Yeah. I'm curious. So yeah, no, I'll just, watch out. I might be the next one. Well, do you know what? Literally on this on this podcast, the door went and I think I just had some delivered. So I'm going to try it and see what, what goes on. All right. Just, well, hopefully uh, we see your blue tongue on Twitter. Put, uh, yeah, we'll put it on. <laughs> I'll stick it <laughs> I'll just say to you, yeah, Nick, I'm not feeling it. But um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what happens with it. But like you say, just do one thing at a time and see what goes on. Listen, mate, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, so I don't want to keep you too much longer. Um, if people want to see more about your work, where, where's the best place for them to go? Uh, look, I love interacting with folks on Twitter. So you can find me on Twitter at Nick Engerer, and that's just N I C K. E-N-G-E-R-E-R. -E -E and it's the same thing for the longevity blog, which is at my personal webpage, nickengerer.org. And you can drop that in the show notes if you'd like. Of course. And absolutely, yeah. you know, if anybody wants to reach out and have a chat, follow up after this, um, that's one of my favorite things to do with the internet. It's great to be able to connect with others who care about their health. Yeah. Listen, I would get in contact with Nick because he's a really approachable guy and wants to help. So why not do that? And if you want to speak to me about your health, um, a lot of people do. Everyone knows you can go to my website, paulburgess.uk. There's a, a button on the homepage, book a free call, and we'll talk about anything to do with your health. I'm not bothered what it is. I just like speaking to people. And I mean, if I can point you in the right direction, great. And if not, then I'll just send you to Nick and he can uh, <laughs> <laughs> he can do something for you. But um, uh, yeah, so listen, if you want to give me a call, then feel free. Anyone can, can book a free call. And um, it's been great to have you on. Um, I might be really um, cheeky and, and approach you again and maybe talk more about the supplementation side of things and what they do, what they are supposed to do for people, not what you should take, but this is what these things actually address in some people, just so other people have a bit more information about what the things actually do, because I think that'd be quite useful for people to, to learn. But until then, again, many thanks for today. And, um, and hopefully I can drag you back on kicking and screaming another day. I'd love that, Paul. Let's do it. Brilliant. Thanks, mate.